there, it's us again. This is my brother Peter, mom and dad, and I'm Dasha. Today, we're going to be showing our friends, Andrew and Lisa, the basics of the internet, and we thought you might want to come along. It'll be cool. Now, here's a little background. When we installed internet access on our computer, I got the whole family involved. It's true. Everybody had their own tasks to do. It was a lot of work, but it was really worth it. Now that I've gotten on the internet, I'd rather be on my computer than doing just about anything. The internet gave us a whole world of exciting new possibilities. So I guess this is a story of how it changed our lives. Maybe it will yours too, with the kids. How to speak elegantly. This is how people start to use a lot of slang and trendy phrases like It's giving, uh, buy girl, period, slay. This is not an appropriate language for an adult woman to be using. Of course, you are not expected to sound like you are from a Shakespearean poem. But also, don't go as low as talking in memes and using teenager slang. A man gets a lot of value from other men out of how classy and how beautiful his woman is. Kind of reminder for my classy ladies. Not elegant. Elegant. You can't be a high maintenance queen without basic dining etiquette. To look elegant for plus size ladies. Invest in good quality shapewear that makes you feel supported and look more cinched in. Have you ever seen someone and you're like, oh, they're cute, but there's just something about them that looks dusty? Not elegant. Elegance. Not elegance. Elegance. Not elegance. Conversation mistakes you want to avoid to speak like a lady. After your appearance, you are judged immediately by the way you speak. It really gives away your class, your education level, how well-mannered you are. It doesn't matter what you are wearing or how you look if you cannot support that with your language. These are not meant to be worn in public, okay? You spend all that money to go get your hair done to be presentable in public or to wear your hair in public. Why would you go outside with a bind on? If they wanna be ratchet, stank, ghetto, promote that, do you, right? And the sector of girls who fall under that category and that aesthetic, have fun with it. I don't want no parts. And the other halfway decent women don't want no parts of it either. How now, brown cow? My name is Madam Eleanor Beatrice Cordelia Everly IV, and I am a femininity coach, elegance expert, and totally normal person with totally normal views. Shanspear invited me today to tell you a bit about my business. I'm the CEO of Girl Boss, Girl Keep, and Girl Make Your Husband a Sandwich or Else He'll Leave You, and I'm also the author of the ebook How to Be a Woman, No, Not Like That. Business is certainly booming as of late. <laughs> As you all may know from previous Shakespeare videos, we in the marketing business have as much power as God. We create the identities and you buy them from us. In fact, you don't exist until you do. We saw this fact thrive in the 40s and 50s when the previously non-existent category of teenager was given life via consumerism. Today, we're seeing this passion renewed as the market opens its eyes to a generally forsaken category of people. A category that has been shunned, manipulated, made fun of, and begrudgingly catered to for centuries. And that is the illustrious market of the feminine. With the summer success of Barbie and the proliferation of all things girl language, as explained by Madison Brown in a recent video, social media is reckoning with a tough question. What does it mean to be ideally feminine? 
Lucky for you, that is my area of expertise. And lucky for me, I intend to cash in on it. But I'm not the only one. There is an entire niche of people just like me, selling courses just like mine, defining by similar standards what it means to be elegantly feminine. Take this content creator, for example. To avoid mobbing, her face will remain blurred and her name unmentioned. From here forward, she will go by the moniker Miss Elegant. In late July of this year, Miss Elegant posted a video to her nearly 500,000 subscribers, explaining things that elegant women never do. Makeup mistakes elegant ladies never make. Wearing brown lipstick with gloss on top of it, or lining your lips in a dark lip liner and filling it out with a nude color. I don't understand the obsession of having massive lips. It has to be proportionate with your natural features. How do I put this respectfully? The streets gathered her like a ponytail. In what felt like an instant, hundreds, thousands, and then millions of people watched and circulated Miss Elegant's video. People shared it with their friends, creators stitched it to their audiences. And little by little, netizens began falling down a rabbit hole of similar videos. Videos that condemned inelegant jewelry, inelegant hairstyles, inelegant cultures. And these netizens began to realize, much to their horror, that every video peddled by these self-proclaimed elegant coaches featured some form of anti-blackness. Well, not every video. Some of the videos teach you how to hold a wine glass without looking poor, and others teach you how to cut your sandwich into bite-sized pieces so you don't take up too much space at the dinner table. You know, normal, empowering stuff. And besides, I would never push a course like that to you. You can trust me with your life. The patterns in these videos are undeniable. Handfuls of TikToks from different creators target at least one fashion item popularized or reclaimed by black and brown women. Baby hairs, acrylic nails, bamboo and hoop earrings. Not all of these things were created by black or brown women, but they have been made fashionable by black and brown women in times where white society shunned us for it. As such, these items became key elements of black femininity and culture. Look at the iconic ghetto fabulous subculture of the 90s and 2000s. It's the quintessential image of black femininity. But if that doesn't sway you, there's this. Choosing to obliterate plausible deniability, a white creator in the femininity and elegance niche was brave enough to dive headfirst into, well, whatever the hell this is. Not elegance. Elegance. Not elegance. They must certainly make a market for the audacious soon. They're growing antsy without the intention. These videos seem to melt effortlessly into other dominating discourse, past and present. As femininity coaching videos began to rise, there was also a spike in attacks aimed at quote unquote ghetto black women entertainers. These attacks focused on people like Sexy Red, who is known for her exuberant personality, as well as Sukiyana, who recently attended the VMAs and, well, had the time of her life. Even still, we can find vestiges of this conversation further back in time, upheld by black elites such as Tyler Perry. I would be a fool to sack my pants. And Monique. If you wear a bonnet out in public, I will kill you. All of these arguments pointed out by different people on different platforms at different instances of time declare that to be visibly and unconditionally black is to be a threat to respectability. It is inelegant. It is uncouth. It is entirely unfeminine. But don't get confused, viewer. This is a tale as old as time. No need to peddle an entire TikTok course about it. This shit's in the history books. Running a femininity course like mine takes a lot of work, but making a video about it is 10 times harder. After I'm done researching, I have pages upon pages of notes, quotes, and citations that need to be organized before I can even begin writing my essay. For this video alone, I watched over 100 TikToks. That's actually less than I watch in general, but 
How do you organize that into an essay? If you're in school or you enjoy writing essays like I do in your free time, organizing might be difficult for you too. And that's where Millinote, the sponsor of today's video, comes in. I use Millinote to store my annotated bibliographies, miscellaneous notes, script dumps, and any mood boards I make for my videos. Before using Millinote, I usually printed out all of my sources and laid them around the floor like I was Batman, <laughs> but that gets messy fast. You end up losing pages somehow, I think my cats carry them off to eat them, but Millinote makes it easy to store dozens of easily accessible ideas in one place. For example, my Lolita video had numerous source mediums. I had various essays, YouTube videos, books, notes, and articles. You can imagine how crowded and confused this might look in a regular document. But this is what my Lolita research board looked like. Everything was easy to find, it's simple, and most importantly, it's pleasing to the eye so that I'm encouraged to come back to it. Speaking of, I love the visual aspect of Millinote. It's perfect for creating mood boards. You can just pull images from the web or your camera roll and easily organize them on screen. I loved adding notes to remind myself of recurring themes or patterns. I even got to brainstorm my set ideas using drawings, which made visualizing the final project way easier. Creating a well-sound essay starts with creating well-organized thoughts, and Millinote allows you to do that with ease. They have over 100 built-in templates for you to choose from and work perfectly for group projects. You can invite colleagues or your peers to leave comments and other feedback on your board, and you can collect collaborate with group members in real time. If you need an organizing tool in your life, especially in time for school, Millinote is available for free with no time limit. Sign up using the link in the description and start your next creative project. Thank you to Millinote for sponsoring this video and let's get back to learning. The interesting thing about the rise of elegant content on TikTok is that it's becoming highly visible at a time of rapid aesthetic change. Celebrities historically known for co-opting black culture like the Kardashian Jenners are undergoing what T. Noir once called the baptism of whiteness. They're shedding the so-called boxer braids and Popeyes photo shoots in their private jets and being made new in the eyes of the media. Those goddamn Popeyes photo shoots. Kylie Jenner now gallivants around Europe in prairie dresses, Kim Kardashian embraces pale skin and blonde hair, and the family is even in the headlines for reducing their BBLs and perhaps for the first time, publicly dating white men. <gasps> Intriguing. The Kardashian Jenners are a powerful family. Everything they do is analyzed, branded, wrapped and handed down to plebeians as a new shiny aspiration. God forbid we all start dating white men. They, along with other rich socialites, influence people in droves to cash in on that quiet luxury, European old money aesthetic featured on their socials. They make you wonder, what does it mean to be desirable and traditionally feminine? And how do you get to participate? I've got a book about that, you know. Act now and you can get 2% off the New York Times bestseller, How to Eat in Front of Him Without Him Noticing You're a Human Being, Soup Edition. This is where femininity coaches, etiquette experts, and elegance educators come in. They understand that social media's interest in old money aesthetics are precisely linked to the type of femininity and elegance they're selling, traditional or conservative, femininity. A lot of the videos in this niche support ideas of elitism, white middle to upper class aesthetics, and anti-blackness. They also don't think you should be able to eat soup in a normal human way. Like our patriarchal forefathers, they enforce purity, piousness, and modesty in dress, sometimes going as far as calling clothing outside of their ideals, quote unquote, ski. These are the concepts that make up the historical image of womanhood, and so it kind of makes sense why so many femininity coaches and elegance trainers have a microaggression problem. They're uncritically appealing to a tradition that exclusively catered to white, affluent, cis women, making their pattern of discrimination almost inevitable. Femininity is a strained subject, especially in the United States. Under systems of discrimination like fat phobia, transphobia, ableism, classism, and racism, the image of womanhood is 
usually the image of one type of woman. There's no trans women, no disabled women, no impoverished women or imprisoned. And certainly there is no black women within this confined image. For example, Bell Hooks once wrote, that no other group in America has so had their identity socialized out of existence as have black women. When women are talked about, racism militates against a recognition of black female interests. When women are talked about, the focus tends to be on white women. Black women were considered inseparable from black men during slavery. It allowed enslavers to justify the abuse enacted upon black women because remember, women at the time, specifically white affluent women, were considered pure and delicate and in need of protection. How can you maintain the dominant gender system wherein white women are dependent upon their husbands, relegated to the house, and so delicately frail while enslaving black women? assaulting them and sending them out to the fields to work. To maintain the institution of gender, you have to strip black women of their femininity in order to excuse your abuse. MEP Takanami argues that black women who were thought to be subhuman by their white masters were not protected from violence or placed on a pedestal like white women. Yeah, patriarchal pedestal, still. Hence, black women were not treated like true women, AKA white women, in the antebellum period, but were instead treated as if they were black men. <laughs> Did someone say true womanhood? I know all about that. The true woman was the American feminine ideal of the 1800s, often called the angel of the house in the United Kingdom. She kept her husband as evil and swayable as he was under divine guidance, all while balancing the entirety of her household on a frail white, hand. Oh, I guess that ties back into what Shanspear was saying, huh? Now that I think about it, we femininity coaches have a lot in common with the true womanhood ideology. My book, Stay Virtuous on the Virtual, tells you all about it for the low, low price of $4,000. I'll tell you what, let's have a little fun. I'm going to read you a few passages from an 1853 behavior book, which was published during the height of the true womanhood era. And then I'm going to show you some femininity coaching TikToks right after. Don't say anything. Don't comment just yet. Just listen. In eating cherries, put your half-closed hand before your mouth to receive the stones. Then, lay them on one side of your plate. To spit out the stones one at a time as you proceed with the cherries is very ungentil. And now, for the TikTok. I think she might have read the book. When eating fish, first remove the bones carefully and lay them on the edge of your plate. Then, with your fork in your right hand and a small piece of bread in your left, take up the flakes of fish. Pouring butter sauce over anything is now considered ungentil. All right, the importance of elegant, almost threatening dining. Let's see what TikTok's got. To speak loudly in the street is exceedingly ungentil and foolish, as what you say will be heard by all who pass by. Don't ever shout, yell, or scream. Your elegance goes out of the window as soon as you get too loud. Large, showy ornaments, by way of jewelry, are exceedingly ungentil. <sighs> and let us ask the audience. These comparisons are important. As Baker Sperry et al. argue, the institution of gender relies on gender imagery, that being the cultural representations of gender and embodiment of gender in symbolic language and artistic productions that reproduce and legitimize gender statuses. By condemning black feminine ideals and promoting the supremacy of Eurocentric ideals, these feminine elegance coaches serve the purpose of legitimizing and supporting the dominant gender system 
that being white affluent womanhood. I mean, of course, this isn't all feminine elegance coaches or their audiences. <laughs> I'm normal. And some people genuinely find joy in feminine identity. They enjoy going to etiquette courses and they enjoy wearing traditionally feminine clothing. And they enjoy paying $4,000 for books by me. Nothing's wrong with that. They're able to participate in these niches without condemning others and without promoting or upholding white supremacy. This video isn't about condemning feminine training or etiquette courses in their entirety. What I'm here to do is analyze and interrogate the rise of TikTok's marketable femininity niche, where creators sell courses and books that feature alienating ideology under the guise of sophistication. Not everyone does it, but a concerning amount of them do. It's hard to give some of the creators in this niche plausible deniability. It almost feels purposeful the way they create a dichotomy between what they support and what they condemn. It's not just that they personally dislike bodycon dresses and textured hair. They think that to embrace these things make you unworthy of respect. They don't just disseminate opinions, they bestow shame. This is evident in the language they use. This is bullshit. The implication behind their words. Elegant women never make this mistake. And the overall self-righteous tone they acquire when talking about their so-called horrible past as unsophisticated women. I used to wear fishnets and denim jeans together. If other people didn't spit on me and call me trash, I would have done it to myself because I deserved it. Following these feminine training videos very well might make you the ideal woman, but it's a double-edged sword. As Baker Sperry et al. argue, the feminine ideal is a complex form of social control, where on one hand, you may feel empowered when quote unquote successfully embodying these ideals. But on the other hand, you know that not following them means being seen as non-woman and getting punished for it. And that punishment, it's almost biblical the way it's reinforced in society. No one wants to be ostracized, abused, or targeted for the way they exist. And it's with this in mind that you could almost see why these femininity coaches peddle such extreme rules in order to be seen as ideally feminine at all times, even in their sleep. Five types of pajamas elegant women never wear. Mariana Ortega wrote an essay titled Being Lovingly, Knowingly Ignorant, White Feminism and Women of Color. Ortega explains the existence of the arrogant perceiver within the patriarchal system. While usually a cis man, the arrogant perceiver can be anyone. Their job is to analyze the culture around them. They determine what makes a woman good or invaluable. They determine her race, her mannerisms, her way of dress. And these determinations are solely based on the level of satisfaction the perceiver receives. If they like modest women, then all women should be modest. If they only like white women, then whiteness becomes a default for femininity. The arrogant perceiver determines what makes an ideal and the person being perceived must then embody that ideal. Ortega argues that women who participate in being the arrogant perceiver themselves possibly do so out of a need for survival. She states, the arrogant eye gives the world intelligibility and thus women want to be inside the web of meaning the arrogant eye creates. But all this does is reinforce a system of hierarchy and purposefully unobtainable aspirations. It supports the notion of self-correction as liberation instead of system correction as liberation. I guess that's true. You know, why don't we extend respect to people who dress outside of tradition? Why does the way we speak show our class and why does that even matter? Why do black aesthetics make you unfeminine? And why do you have to sit perfectly, eat perfectly, Fold yourself up into tiny bite-sized pieces, wear perfect clothing to work and to bed and to the grocery store. Why do you have to put so much time, all of the time, to receive 
basic human respect isn't living enough? I mean, what system do we need to criticize? What archaic belief do we need to dismantle so that I can sit at a restaurant and eat my sandwich without fearing the slightest bit of imperfection? Why do I fear the slightest moment of imperfection? These coaches believe that by assuming the characteristics of the dominant gender ideal, that is white affluent womanhood, you'll avoid being punished for being yourself. This is also found in discourse within the black community, discourse that condemns so-called uncouth behavior and dress. The purpose of respectability politics is to have a marginalized person distance themselves from the elements of the social cultural identity to curry favor with the dominant culture in their environment. Historically, this has been used against black people as they're led to view the virtues of self-care and self-correction as strategies to lift the black poor out of their condition. To progress as a black person in a white society, and this is something that's argued by the likes of Monique and Tyler Perry, Black people must align with white ideals, especially because for so much of our history, success lurked beneath the gaze of white America. What we find elegant, classy, and acceptable is often aligned with whiteness, and that is why when we talk about sophistication, elegance, and ideal femininity, it is almost impossible to untangle it from years of white supremacy. So I can already see some of the comments now. Uh, Just because we think black people should respect themselves out in public doesn't mean we're appealing to white people. And I know that's going to be in the comments because that's already a popular talking point amongst people who I would argue participate in respectability politics. So let's start by gaining some further knowledge about respectability. Michaela Pitkin et al. argue, that respectability requires condemning behaviors deemed unworthy of respect within one's group. It also endorses values that contradict stereotypes. We see both of these statements at play within certain black spaces like that of respectable black TikTok and interviews by black elites. My first point is, who defines what respectable behavior and dress is? Who defines what makes someone sophisticated, refined, and dare I say, civilized. When you ask for respect from these people, what do you feel is necessary to receive that respect? Would you keep cultural or social items related to your experience as a marginalized person? Or would you appeal to their standards? The concept of sophistication and respectability don't exist in a raceless vacuum. Due to years of subjugation, a lot of systems, standards, and rules we have are based on some kind of discrimination, whether that be sexism, transphobia, racism, fat phobia, classism, and etc. And these systems, standards, and rules were defined long ago by white supremacy and I would argue colonization. White supremacy has defined the standards of elegance and respectability, not because white people are the beacons of decency, but because some of them, of the racist or ignorant persuasion, <laughs> believe that they're the norm while everyone else are variants. So in that effect, you are judged against them and not alongside them. No one is saying that you shouldn't have manners or basic self-respect, you should. No one is saying that you shouldn't dress up, no one is forcing a bonnet on your head. We simply want to interrogate the idea of respectability and point out who creates these rules, who these rules are enforced against the most, and who gets to live outside of these rules without being so heavily policed. My second point is, you may not be consciously appealing to white people or white standards, but you're clearly asking for approval from someone. Right? If you weren't, I don't think you'd care so much about what Rebecca down the street is wearing to the grocery store. You wouldn't view black people as a monolith and you wouldn't view that monolith as a mirror of yourself. I personally know that no matter what I do or what Sexy Red does or what Sukiyana does, there will always be a sect of people, racist at worst and ignorant at slightly less worse, <laughs> who will have preconceived notions about black people due to centuries of 
racism. I don't expect a random black woman wearing a bonnet in Walmart to fix that. It's the job of the ignorant or racist person to educate themselves, not the black woman minding her business running errands. Shucking for white approval doesn't always look like jiving, you know? Sometimes it looks like loving ignorance. It looks like policing an entire community just to make sure you look good in the dominant eye. If white approval didn't matter, if outside approval didn't matter at all, you would be more comfortable minding your business <laughs> because you know it doesn't affect you. But you can't do that because you think a black woman wearing a bonnet out in public speaks for all black people. And who are they speaking to in your mind? More respectable, quote unquote, classes of people. And who are those quote unquote respectable people in your mind? All right, thank you. <laughs> Let me give you an example of how deeply this political thinking can rot a brain. A commenter on a TikTok video said, I think the problem with elegance coaching is who sets these standards? Why are things we do considered low class? It was put in place to exclude us. The creator of the video, who originally condemned public bonnet wear, replied, they, being white people, excluded us, being black people, because we refuse to act right. A lot of our people wanted to do whatever they want, and that's never okay. This is interesting. It shows us that the purpose of respectability is not just individual social elevation, it's group appeasement. You want to show white people in the case of black respectability politics or cis men in the case of gender respectability politics that your identity is capable of being respected. You want to show them that the years of stereotypes and poor representation are wrong that you have been renewed, reborn, and refined as a viable person for their tolerance. The issue is, this puts a lot of pressure on the person being discriminated against and not enough pressure on the person doing the discrimination. And also it just kind of sucks because if they could, respectability believers would probably have Megan Thee Stallion banned from posting up close ass shaking videos on her Instagram. And really, I can't have that. I need those videos. To subscribe to respectability politics is to subscribe to the dominant culture. It's to believe that you, a marginalized person, must transform yourself to be digestible under the dominant eye. It's to reinforce and maintain systems of oppression. In short, it's to kill differences at all costs. Dear Shanspeer, dear Shanspeer, dear, dear Shanspeer, dear Shanspeer, dear Shanspeer, you've got mail. Andrea, a 23 year old Mexican NB writes, I was a complicated young girl, raised by parents who wanted boys but believed in traditional gender roles. Influenced by boys' cartoon and old Hollywood depictions of glamour and femininity, but born during the rise of social media like gaming and beauty influencers. So I think I grew up exactly at the right time to experience all sides of femininity. Marketable femininity is just a repackaging of all the old values we were taught to embrace in the 90s and early 2000s. And on its own, that's not a bad thing. Some of us have chosen that and actually want help to become our idealized form of femininity. On a more personal level for Andrea, those courses to me would be negative. I know because I hear enough of that from my parents and family. They tried to force women into a box that expired years ago. It's about refusing to let things change. An anonymous agender user replied to my prompt explaining how femininity training videos may be helpful for trans women and trans femmes, which I thought was very important to include. I unfortunately didn't receive a ton of replies from trans women and trans femmes by the deadline to include in this video, but I did find a nice little niche on TikTok that helps trans people with voice training and otherwise feminine tips. And the comment sections are very positive and they do express how 
much these videos help them in their transition or in their journey of femininity. I wish I was omnipresent or all-knowing so that I could include a more in-depth section for you in this video, but I think community voice is far more important and I think hearing it directly from trans people, um, specifically trans women and trans femmes, is best. Alpha states, I also think the thought of being able to buy femininity can actually appeal to queer people who are bullied into believing their queerness makes them less feminine and have trouble with self-image because at least in my experience, I would have paid any price to get back into that elite club of femininity after coming out. And if it meant consume, 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 I consumed, consumed, consumed. Aurora writes, as someone who fully enjoys the frilly, feminine, girly style of aesthetic, it means a lot to me that being girly and feminine is being more normalized on a trendier scale. But as a plus-size black girl, it's always been normal to never see myself represented by the softness of pink ribbons and pink painted toes or billowing lace curtains on a sunny day kissing my already brown skin. I've always had to imagine myself getting to walk in those ballet shoes. Only as an adult have I realized the reason. I was never going to be seen as delicate unless I kicked the door down with my heels to be included. Selling the dream that the Cinderella shoe does fit all if you just chop off your toes to fit the mold is dangerous because now we know that one size does not truly fit all. While some girls are princesses, some of us are only allowed to pretend. I have to admit, this was a very hard video to make. It's one of those topics that can't be condensed into a palatable video, and no matter how organized your notes are, shout out to Millinote, it's still hard to articulate something so multifaceted. Nothing I talk about is black and white, but especially this topic. And it's an impassioned topic. It's hard to talk about it without feeling affected. For me, femininity is important. Even though I consider myself outside of the binary, presenting in my usual ultra feminine way is significant to the image I have of myself. It feels like an act of reclamation. Even though I know my vision of gender is different from traditional expectations, there's still this fear of doing or not doing gender the wrong way. When I came to terms with my relationship, or lack thereof, to the binary, I was terrified because I thought I failed at being a woman. I thought something must be wrong with me because I couldn't do it or more so I didn't want to do it, the way conservative gender institutions asked of me. I don't think femininity is something that is easily definable. There is a fly. E easily definable because it looks different for everyone regardless of how you identify. And I think that's the best part of expression, finding a way to feel comfortable and euphoric in ways that works best for you. And I know that's easier said than done, especially in our current climate where trans people and queer people and anyone who doesn't adhere to tradition is targeted violently and politically. But I wanna say that videos about femininity coaching and elegance training, if those things make you happy, if they make you feel less alone on whatever journey you're on, then you should keep watching them. But I also want to tell you to be mindful of what you internalize because watching videos like this not elegant. won't make you any more sophisticated. That was a very contentious word in my research, by the way, sophistication. I wanted to know what elegance coaches meant when they parroted that word. In my opinion, a lot of them unfortunately mean Eurocentric aesthetics and mannerisms, but the true definition of sophistication is having, revealing, or proceeding from a great deal of worldly experience and knowledge of fashion and culture. You cannot be sophisticated and ignorant. This, not elegance is ignorant. It flattens worldly experience and it spits in the face of culture. Your ugly sandals won't save you from that, by the way, in my opinion, but there are some solutions. I would first start by reading Mariana Ortega's essay on loving ignorant feminism. And then I would listen to these quotes. Audre Lord asks you to look inside yourself and touch that terror and loathing of any difference that lives there. 
see whose face it wears. Elizabeth Spellman says to re-examine the traditions that reinforce sexism and racism. And if you still don't get it, that's okay. Take your time, genuinely. But if you're one of the coaches I watched for this video and you learned nothing and you want to continue making microaggressive remarks in your comment sections, if you want to continue dictating the feminine level of blackness, if you want to continue using elegance as a shield for your ignorance, I have a better quote for you. Jackie Ina, the vision of femininity and elegance, once said, It sounds like you have some rewriting to do. Thank you and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Bye!